Live from the JSA Podcast Studio, presenting Data Movers, showcasing the leaders behind the headlines in the telecom and data center infrastructure industry. Welcome to our new podcast series, Data Movers. I'm your host, Jamie Scott Okataya, CEO and founder of JSA. And along with me, my co-host, co-conspirator, top B2B social media influencer, Mr. Evan Christel. Evan? How are you? Happy New Year. Happy New Year. And welcome to Data Movers, where we sit down with uh, the most influential folks in today's leading data center and telco world, supporting the network infrastructure requirements of this new normal. Jamie, are you a gadget person? Uh, love gadgets. I live uh, and breathe technology. Just and, uh, Of course. Well, we have CES at the moment, which is gone virtual and the biggest consumer tech show of the year kind of sets the stage for a lot of tech. Uh, is that something you're, uh, you've are you been into in the past at CES? My husband definitely attends uh, annually. I, I'm always tra traveling or prepping for PTC uh, with my other data center telecom folks. So I don't get a chance to actually walk the floor ever, but I, I, do you walk the floor? Like, are you actually there? I'm always reading the headlines for sure. I am. I'm normally there. I'll be glued to the screen virtually this time. And I'm always looking for that next cool emerging gadget or tech that can somehow make my life better. Maybe, you know, this is one I acquired over the holidays. It's called Aura. It's a ring wearable mm -hmm. and it basically tracks sleep and temperature and movement and steps and, uh, and calories and all kinds of good stuff. And it's charged once a week, it's waterproof. So that was a CES discovery. And I'm sure there's something cool to find uh, this year as well. So it's like an Apple watch for your finger. It is, it is. So wearables and digital health is, is a big area of uh, focus at CES. Um, but let's get on to our guest. I think we have a good one this week. Yeah, and let's get right into it. We have one of the major data movers of our industry with us today. I'm so excited to welcome Mr. Abner Papachato, CEO of Server Farm. Abner, welcome to Data Movers. Hello, Jamie. Hello, Evan. Good to see you and welcome Abner, um, CEO of Server Farm. So Abner, how many servers do you grow on your farm? That, that's my first <laughs> question. It's, it's uh, se highly seasonal. <laughs> seasonal you know i thought that I, I but in all seriousness you know we used to talk about server farms now it's all we talk about data center and cloud and i, I love my server farm back in the day so, so tell me what is and who is server farm server farm is um is a company uh that we uh established uh around the mid 2000s we actually have been in the data center business uh since uh the late 90s um and we started uh, looking at this telecom uh, boom. Of course, was the what was more switching and, and CLEX and all that coming into our office buildings at the time and wanting to rent space and, and not have people in it, you know, have uh, a bunch of cables and, and equipment. It looked interesting. We've done a couple of those. Then uh, we saw that a lot of people had the same ideas, but uh, not enough clients. So we stopped and there was the bust. Uh, we continued to buy uh, telecom um, facilities for a while and uh, then uh, established the name Server Farm. Um, it's our, uh, we're, we're farmers that mostly feed electricity and air conditioning. <laughs> um, and we provide uh, mostly wholesale services, but really we provide a lot of services. Uh, our to, to a lot of clients, our goal is really to make the, the physical part of the digital work world efficient. Um, we see everything, we see data centers as a very, uh, as a very young industry and, and, and really a very inefficient industry right now as far as the physical part goes. And we have looked at it and studied it and um, developed a lot of software and practices around it, uh, and we'll get more into it later on. But really the goal is to, is to make the physical simple and let people concentrate on running applications. Yeah, I love that. And uh, that brings me back to when uh, we first chatted in your, in your office uh, in LA, um, which has a beautiful view of a runway. And um, 
and knowing uh, you're a pilot and your interest in aeronautics, um, just the efficiency a pilot must must have uh, to to lift off, to launch a plane into the air and, and take those um, many, many people or, or things into the air and keep them safe during this whole passage. Um, the efficiency, the, the checklist, the uh, uh, the attention to detail. I feel like you bring all that to our data center space. Yeah, it's uh, it's really about about running critical operations. And if you think about critical op- operations, uh, aviation is is one of the most critical operations people people um, execute. People do, and it's and it's pretty amazing how many operations uh, the, the aviation industry does and how good they have become at, at, at not crashing, at, at running critical um, operations safely. And that's through a lot of things. That's through a lot of learning through the years. It's, it's, it's through very good design, very good operation ma- ma- uh, matrix, uh, following checklists, learning from, from previous mistakes, uh, maintenance procedures, and a lot of things that us in our young industry we can we can really learn a lot from and i i love aviation i love design i love redundancy um there's a couple of things that uh aviation has the data centers don't have obviously the different industries we we're not that concerned with weight uh aviation is so they have to bring redundant only the redundancy they need and through the years you learn about it the too much weight and actually too much redundancy can create problems so I think as an industry, we can learn a lot from industries that have done other critical operations and, and help, uh, you know, learning from other people's mistakes is always a smart thing to do in my book, paying less tuition. Yes. Yeah, great advice. And uh, unlike the aviation industry, uh, the data center industry is going through a bit of a boom, a boomlet, um, given this new reality we're in. Uh, and you've taken a nice approach of prioritizing this modernization over just build outs and capacity. Can you discuss that kind of trade off? Yeah, again, it's it's uh, it has to do with the fact that we've been here. A, we've been here for a while. B, we like efficiency. Uh, we 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 really have a couple of plays in the industry, but efficiency and and um, and being green is a part of it. There's a lot of buildings. That, that are very good buildings that could be reused as data centers. And we looked for them early on. We have a number of them. Um, some of them just couldn't be replicated today with dollars. Like our Titan building in Eastern Washington was built as the headquarters for the Titan missile pro, uh, program. It's built to withstand a 10 megaton atomic explosion within half a mile. Um, you, couldn't, you couldn't replicate it. And it's built to move air you could not build a better data center shell, and it's there now. Has the benefit of having three cent power. When we um, when when we use an existing building, our our, um, our our greenhouse footprint is is diminished by a lot, um, as compared to to destroying a building and building a new building. Uh, so so we like that, and then a lot of other places, like in Chicago, it, it takes us downtown where. We can get better infrastructure, better better electricity, better power, and, and you just couldn't build this building downtown. And and it just gets us into that environment. And I think it's going to happen more and more. There's going to be a lot of, uh, of, of greenfield data centers that we do as well in places where we can't get existing. But a lot of the more inner city, dense, you know, last mile, um, Kind of data centers are going to be readaption of existing buildings. Yeah. And that, that takes me to uh, look back to 2020. You know, obviously, uh, unprecedented year. I hate saying that because everyone calls it that, but a very difficult year for many companies. Yet, Server Farm, obviously, you guys were thriving. You launched In Command Knock, um, providing data center management services for global brands. You added your Toronto facility during the pandemic. Uh, you accomplished a $200 million recapitalization. Can you tell us what do you attribute to this success? 
Uh, first of all, thank you. And uh, really, it's it's obviously the the industry has been in growth, but in in our part, it's really great people. We have uh, really great people working in the company in a lot of disciplines. Uh, we're very good at the basic design and operations of data center. Uh, we have Sam Brown running running uh, design and build. He delivered the data center in Toronto in in the hardest time. Um, on time, on budget, um, couldn't be more appreciative uh, to him. Um, we have a great operating uh, part with with Jim Shanahan and Mike Whitman that built uh, that, that built the crew there, and we have a very nice uh, and basically the in command staff, the people that actually take and 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 get our customers as much information as they can about about their operation and data centers probably as much as your sleeping aid and your uh, your body tracking gadget that you bought we try to do the same for our data center customers we tell them how well the servers are awake sleeping how much electricity they're taking if they're efficient if they want to bring more do they need more power more space we try to right size everybody um and all these disciplines together, disciplines together have a lot of uh, a lot of demand, and and we see it. Um, um, we we just try to solve problems for our customers, and it seems to be working. And uh, talk a little bit more about that in command platform, um, which I, as I understand it, it provides a cloud like experience for, for data centers. How is this more than just another data center infrastructure management software? It's it's uh, it's data center infrastructure management as a service. So we basically provide our clients, whether it's in within our data centers or in their own data centers or other providers data centers, as much information as we can about their about their their physical layout, the the physical implementation. So we give them. Um, we let them know what sh- what each rack is doing, how much electricity is taking. Is it really backed up? Are there any problems in the data center? Is there is there maintenance coming? What's going to be affected with the maintenance? And we do a lot of uh, once we have all the information, we do a lot of what ifs. What if I wanted to change these servers to to the next generation of servers? Do I have enough space? Do I have enough power? Do I have can I do it within my racks? Do I have to change it? Is there down downtime? We do that for all the physical um, aspects of the data center, electrical, mechanical, and network. And, and um, we're gonna have some very exciting network things coming, adding on to uh, in command in, in the near future. And we really let people concentrate on running application. The physical is not a problem. We hear about digital transformation a lot. And the cloud is a wonderful thing and public cloud is a wonderful thing, but a lot of customers also have to run applications that are, don't run very efficiently in public cloud. We try to make running these applications and running physical servers as easy as possible, whether it's in our place and other place and everything we do. And that's, that's in command It's basically, we'll take care of the physical, you take care of, we let give you the freedom to take care of, of your application layer and your virtual layers. Wow, very cool. Sounds like I could run my data center via an in-command app on my smartphone. That would be yeah. that would be dream. So you re- also recently announced an initiative to develop data centers in Israel, not necessarily known as a hub of uh, data center technology around the world. So tell us about that initiative and when are you anticipating uh, construction there? Yeah, so we have been uh, research. Obviously, I was born in Israel, but or not obviously, but I was born in Israel um, and uh, speak the language. Uh, most of my immediate family is still there. Um, so I've, I have long uh, connections to Israel. Israel, as we know, is a technology leader and, and uh, all the major companies have big development hubs in Israel. There is a lot of technology uh, coming out of Israel. There's uh, uh, there's a fascinating book called Startup Nation that can give you um, a, a glimpse. Whoever is interested, but Israel puts together a lot of technology. Um, Israel now has some 
data centers in Israel, a lot of the cloud services they've been getting from overseas, um, these cloud services, because of a few things, are, are coming onshore. And um, they're looking for places to develop in Israel. Uh, like a lot of markets developing in Israel, you would need to know what you're doing in the market. Just the whole construction permit, electricity, ability to build different places is, is very unique to the country. Luckily, um, I come from a family that developed a lot in Israel, and we've got uh, a very good handle on that. We also have a very good handle on, on developing modern data centers. So we, we enjoy a unique benefit of, of speaking a couple of languages, speaking the international data center language, um, developing modern data centers. We also speak Hebrew, we speak Hebrew development, and we can create a translation layer to what is becoming a cloud, hyperscale, and, and digital transformation way coming to a country who is one of the leader of, of technology in the world. So it, it's kind of a perfect storm that we're in the middle. And even more exciting, um, the Middle East is uh, changing. And the Middle East is changing f uh, along with the world from, uh, from a fossil fuel um, type economy looking to the future where it's going to have to you know, find other sources of income, employment, and, and wealth for its people. And they understand, uh, the countries around the Middle East understand that they need to work together, I think, to, to, to achieve a, a better future for everybody. Therefore, we see some peace treatments, we see there's a lot of geopolitical changes coming. But what that means is that Israel, being a technology leader, is going to be in the forefront of providing its neighbors, which is a beautiful story. It's, 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 it's the former enemy is going to provide them a lot of technology and this road to the future. Uh, so that's another reason why Israel is booming. It's not only for itself. It's also as, a, as, as the technology hub to the, to the whole um, area. Well, Avner, I can't wait to come over to Tel Aviv and take a tour of the data center and along the way spend a couple of weeks on the beach in Tel Aviv. Um, so please keep us up to speed. And you know what I love about your story, Abner, too, is, um, you know, as you're an Israeli-American, I'm an Italian-American, and um, to bring the that international data center language, like you said, I loved that, uh, you know, back to our home countries and, and to uh, strengthen the economies there and and and, uh, and foster those communities, um, especially uh, in the Middle East. Uh, you know, it's such a beautiful, uh, beautiful heart pull for me, and, and I, I love that. Um, I also... To get on to the more like personal side of Abner now interview, um, I also hear you are an avid surfer. Is that is that right? Yeah, I, I, I surf. By the way, two of the cables coming into Israel are yeah. Telecom Italia. So, oh, I love that. See the connections coming straight straight from you to us. <laughs> love it. So we appreciate we appreciate the service. <laughs> um. So. Um, so I know, uh, I know. Obviously, uh, you're a phenomenal businessman, an aviator, an avid surfer. How did these all work together to, to build build our Abner? It's uh, it, it's it's there is um, first of all the aviation part is is um, is because I I lived in Texas for a while um, when when I got out of school and I couldn't surf. So I had to do something and, and I'm not a very good team sport player. So if you're in Dallas, Texas, and you're not very good in team sports and you don't golf, you're pretty much screwed. Yeah. <laughs> so I had to do something. So I started flying. That's because I couldn't surf. So uh, that's how that happened. And, um, but surfing, I grew up surfing in Israel, which is kind of a weird place. It's like Florida for surfing. It's small wave and it's, uh, you know, it's not, it's definitely not Hawaii where we should be now. Um, uh, but it's uh, small waves actually create the best surfers in the world. The best surfer in the world is 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 um, Kelly Slater, who grew up in in the west coast of Florida. And if you can create energy out of a small wave, you can surf a big wave. Mm. So it's about energy preservation and knowing how to get you know get forward without a big push and. 
I think surfing is a lot like business. You have to choose the right wave that will actually give you a good ride and not, and not just wipe you out. You have to have a little fortitude to know what to get into, what to get out of. You also have to know every once in a while you have to take a wipeout. So it's, it's a good little analogy to, um, to how we, we, we live in, in this world. Phenomenal answers. I love that. All right. So we are on to our rapid fire section. I love this section. Uh, so uh, basically, uh, this is some fun facts we want to learn about you. So tell us the very first thing that comes to mind when we ask you these silly questions. Uh, so, okay, here you are in the hot seat. Uh, which instruments do you play, if any? I, uh, I play guitars and pretty much every, uh, every uh, stringed instrument that, wow. that exists. I, I actually, I, here you go, fun fact. I went to music school. Right. And I used to play, I used to play, I used to play like jazz and blues and rock and clubs. I still do. I know you're quite the Renaissance man. It was very Steve Job-esque here. Yes. <laughs> I hear you got a wonderful uh, new addition to your collection, a, an Italian delivery during COVID. Tell us more. I had a guy that sent me an Italian guitar right at the beginning of uh, COVID. Uh, sent it to me from, it was like, from then it was fright when, when the package came again, do I have to wrap it down? What do I do? Like, right. You know, when we were very afraid, we were, we were wiping down our groceries. So an acoustic guitar, just a, it, it's made the in most Italy. Amazing, it's the uh, most yeah. Play for us. <laughs> it's the most amazing thing there is. Look at this thing. Oh my goodness. What a beauty. It looks like a violin, right? <laughs> all right favorite wave to surf it would have to be a uh, cloud break in fiji all restaurants in fiji but definitely fiji wonderful the most used app on your phone unfortunately zoom <laughs> <laughs> That's 2021 if i've ever heard it yeah, yeah we, we were looking to change that <laughs> all right this one's tough favorite movie Favorite movie, favorite movie would have to be Napoleon Dynamite. Oh, awesome. wow. Not a traditional choice. I, I, you know, the answer here for me is always The Godfather, but that's a good one. Alternative. You and my yeah, husband. I have like kids. <laughs> <laughs> and that brings us to favorite hobbies. That's, there's a lot of competition for that one. Um. I would, uh, at the end of the day, I would still say music. Mm. Love it. And if you could have dinner with one person, dead or alive, who would it be? I thought about this for, for, for a little while, and I think I'm going to stick with Quincy Jones. Nice. Because that's, uh, that's a guy that's a trumpet player, which you wouldn't expect much from being a trumpet player that managed to play with all of the people that started jazz, the Miles Davises, the, the Dizzy Gillespie. Then he started writing and wrote for everybody, Frank Sinatra and, and, and so forth. And then jumped generations to, to you know, producing Michael Jackson, produce, uh, bringing us the French Prince, bringing us... I've never seen somebody who took something and made it so versatile. We need a music podcast, Avner. This is far more interesting than a data center, frankly. So, no, I just want to even listen to his <laughs> playlist. Like, I, I <laughs> well, so. we'll put that in the show notes. How, how about that, Avner's playlist? <laughs> I'll, I'll actually send you. I'll send you my daughter did one. So, I'll, I'll, oh, please, it's much better than what I would do. That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, and talking about daughters, uh, what's your favorite? What's your greatest achievement? So, I, I would say that. Uh, Initially, is actually marrying my wife, which produced the other favorite achievement, which is my kids. So <laughs> that's the that's the sequence of things. Um, I think that still is the favorite achievement. And I actually sat with her yesterday, and, and we, you know, started starting to dawn on us that our kids are much smarter than us. Mm. And um, I think that's the best compliment you could ever get. 
I have a six month old and, and my husband and I were just saying that yesterday. Like, <laughs> like she just knows way more than I could ever in six months of life. <laughs> yeah. It's amazing. So mine are between 21 and nine. So with the, with the same wife. Oh, and, and uh, how many? Three? I have four girls. Four girls. Four girls. Oh, fabulous. Yeah. So that's a, and at some point they become this, they're six months old. They're amazing. You get, it's like you're a bundle of love. You can't, you can't describe it right before, uh, but they become people. They become real people with real personalities. You know, some of it you love unconditionally, some less, but it's, it's just the whole person. It's, it's, it's amazing. It's to me, it's a beautiful thing to see. It is. And that's, it's a great, way to end the, the show in this time of challenges and uh and uh, lockdown so uh you're, you're on my list of one of the persons i must meet this year if not the end of the year early next year so no, we we'll would, have that we to would look love forward to do to. it uh so so uh the the goal is to make your uh you know your your physical things easier to run with a little bit of spirituality mm. I love it. We're going we're gonna to steal that quote from, from you, actually. So that's, that's brilliant. So there you have it, guys. Thank you, Avner, for joining us, uh, for giving us a fabulous insight to you as the businessman, you as uh, uh, the spiritual guru. And, um, and thank you, everyone, for, for listening in to today's Data Movers podcast. Be sure to check us out on jsa.net slash podcast for upcoming data center data movers episodes releasing every other Wednesday morning and other JSA podcast series. Uh, so go ahead and click around there. Yeah. got to keep the train moving and be sure to follow us on Twitter at Jay Scotto and Evan Kerstell and continue the discussion and chat there. And as always guys, happy networking. Mm -hmm.